Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by GoIowaAwesomeAndRivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by Adam Jacoby and Ross Binder on this Tuesday evening post Kirk Ferentz presser, post women's win over West Virginia to send him to the Sweet 16, and post NIT bow out by the men we'll hit it all today on the podcast but before we get started make sure that you subscribe if you are watching on youtube you hit that like button drop a comment let us know what you're thinking about all things hawkeye sports right now of course if you're on apple Podcasts, spotify google play wherever you may be listening hit that subscribe button because you might be listening but you might not be subscribed as well that way you don't miss a single episode of us and of course if you're on apple Podcasts, spotify make sure you leave that rate and review it helps us out A lot. We're going to start off talking a little bit about the men falling in the NIT. Not only that, but as of this afternoon, Tony Perkins has entered the portal. Iowa starting guard and second leading scorer at 14.6, I think, points per game this year. Somewhere around then. 14 point point something. He 4.6 assists per game and 4.2 rebounds per game as well. One of the leading players on this roster in 2023. 2024 one of the better combo guards in the the conference at least when he's on anyway and uh yet another blow to the backcourt of the Hawkeyes coming up next season along with DeSante Bowen hitting the portal I don't think we have talked since then but um an unfortunate set of events for for the Hawkeyes a uh thin thinning backcourt that doesn't have any players coming in in the 24 class other than walk on uh trace and buchanan out of indianapolis it just got thinner so it's not the end of the world this team wasn't exactly going to be anything to ride home about going into next season but losing one of your more productive players on the offensive side of the floor is not ideal though he did struggle towards the end of the season um adam you were on your long ride home before you saw the news break what would you think about Perkins hitting the portal? Uh, I was surprised and uh, not really in a good way either. I we There had been a few rumblings here and there about whether Perkins would be back or not. And, and he had a few options. And, and Fran even mentioned that in his statement that uh, going pro was one of his options returning or, uh, you know, entering the portal and finding somewhere else. But when you look back at Perkins' career at Iowa, obviously there's there's plenty of fans who, you know, think that he left some um, untapped potential on the table. But he had been a bit of a project recruit from Fran McCaffrey. And when he came in, he didn't really have much of a jumper. Uh, Iowa was basically his only Big Ten uh, offer. And Fran had even uh, mentioned uh, during a uh, halftime interview of all places a uh, conversation that he had had with Perkins's high school coach. And uh, one of the things that uh, the coach told him was, look, if you put him on that flight to Iowa City, he's going to want to commit. So don't bring him in here to only like bring him that far. And sure enough, Fran made sure that if Perkins was going to be on campus, that he was wanted there, that there was going to be an offer and there was going to be a committable offer. And the two stuck to that. Um, Perkins got demonstrably better as a Hawkeye during his career, but he also didn't get good enough for a lot of fans, especially when it comes to consistency, especially when it comes to defense. Uh, He, you know, had a very high opinion of himself, of his game, of his skills. And and when you're that athletic, for good reason, you know, like you, you should hold yourself in some high esteem at that point. But, you know, we had, we had, uh, Elliot, we had talked to him during media day prior to the season. And he had mentioned that uh, he wanted to be first team all defense in the big 10. Didn't really come to fruition. And a big part of that was consistency. Uh, You know, what his game to game effort level was going to be on both ends of the floor. And, And that was always sort of the last step for him to climb as a Hawkeye. And and it looks like he won't be doing that in Iowa City next year, wherever he's going to be playing. So that part is a little bit unfortunate, uh, a little bit dispiriting for for those of us who still believe in, you know, things like loyalty, commitment, uh, things like that. But at the same time, 
you know, he's got to make a, uh, he's got to make the Tony Perkins decision. He's got to make the decision that's best for him long-term, even if that's not going to be in Iowa City. It's just, it is a little bit disappointing to see that, how tight both of those two were with each other over the course of that career and to see Perkins's co college career and somewhere else, presumably. Yeah, uh, a bit of a bummer. Uh, Ross, what did you think about this news when it came down? Were you surprised? I don't think I was too surprised, and that was primarily because of, I think, the way Perkins just seemed uh, in games, in uh, media sessions, in just kind of in any sort of observable, observable fashion over the last, you know, three, four weeks, uh, maybe two, three weeks. He had seemed just a little bit checked out, um, especially in games, I don't think. Uh, you know, that full effort and attention to detail, you know, it would come and go, I think, from at times there'd be spurts where he'd be really locked in, really playing hard. Um, and there'd be other times where didn't quite see that on offense or especially defense. Um, and so it, it just did kind of seem like Tony, if he wasn't, you know, really locked in here, then, you know, it would be, uh, you know, see him moving on somewhere else. I don't know that I saw him entering the portal um, because, I mean, he spent four years here at Iowa, but, you know, thanks to the magic of the COVID year, he does have one more year uh, of eligibility to use so he can go, you know, somewhere else and, uh, and make use of that. Uh, and, you know, so given that I, I, I could see why, why he would depart, why he would, you know, want to maybe find something different. Um, you know, it, I find it bittersweet, honestly. Um, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, I thought when, when Perkins was a recruit, there were some really exciting things about him. He had some uh, phenomenal athleticism and, uh, you know, he could just really just jump out of the gym. And, you know, you wanted to see how he could develop that at Iowa. And I think that's kind of where the, less sweet i wouldn't say bitter but the less sweet part of his game comes in as you know parts of it developed parts of it didn't um he was still breathtaking when he would attack the rim uh in, and in transition like yeah, he was phenomenal um but in the half court uh if he's you know shooting jump shots shooting three pointers mm, that was not the best part of his game and it didn't get significantly better from when he started at Iowa to now, you know, I guess we're at the end, uh, there was improvement, but just, you know, and the consistency there, like some games, the jump would be working and sometimes it wouldn't. And uh, so that was tough. Uh, Elliot, you know, you were our, our beat writer covering him every game. So what did you, what did you make of this news? Uh, I wasn't exactly surprised either. I think uh, this is a situation where he can go out and I mean, like if we're talking about him potentially going pro, he can go through the draft or yeah, the draft process. Right. And Patrick McCaffrey said that he's planning on going pro. Uh, Tony Perkins can go pro if Patrick McCaffrey can go pro. Of course, there's always the option to go overseas. Um, I, I don't see Tony Perkins being anything more than, than that in a G league player, at least right now. I mean, he could go out and surprise us. Of course, his athleticism has been referenced already. Not a consistent enough jump shot. Um, the the defense he showed flashes i i'd be pretty surprised if he didn't lead the team in steals this year but he's just that type of player right he he goes after steals when he can and to his benefit sometimes to well not his benefit and anyway with with all that said he's still a damn good player and he's a combo guard that can score i i think i said this on a must have been a radio appearance recently, but Tony's a a guy that not a lot of teams have, but that a lot of teams could use. And so with four years of experience, being the second leading scorer, second team all conference by the coaches in the Big Ten, he's a guy that could go get a bag, go get an NIL bag and play at a, at a basketball school. He's from Indiana, right? I don't think he goes to Indiana. I don't think he goes to Purdue because he still has that chip on his shoulder. 
uh, regarding them passing over him in his recruitment. At the end of the day, maybe he does. You know, I mean, his grandma did just pass away, right? Like being closer to home probably doesn't hurt. Additionally, he is a player that could actually go to a place like Kansas, like Duke, like UConn, Blue Bloods, and get time, maybe start, maybe fill what they need, and therefore get a ton of money. I, I, I really think that that that's probably a better situation for him than Iowa, than, um, than going pro, because he can still make a bunch of money, like I said, but he can also go like to the Big 12 and play in the best conference in the country or the ACC, considering who's all in the, the tournament right now. But I, I don't see Iowa necessarily being the best option for him going into next season. I think he can play in front of a full arena, fill up his bank account, and get uh, another year of of play and probably a better conference that would help him develop and maybe develop in a different way, right? Like he's been in Iowa City for four years. He's learned under Sherman Dillard. He's learned under Fran McCaffrey. He's learned under Courtney Eldridge. But now he can go somewhere else that has maybe more routinely, sure, Iowa has made their NBA prospects, right? But maybe more routinely put out those type of prospects um, like some of those blue bloods. So I think there's, there's a place for him out there. Of course, um, I think it was the portal report. I'll lead the list of schools that have reached out since he entered the portal because it's going to be a hell of a lot longer than this. I think they tweeted this out like an hour after the news broke that he entered the portal that we confirmed um, with a source at uh, Iowa.rivals.com. But schools that have reached out to this point, Ole Miss, Arizona State, Arkansas, Mizzou, Oklahoma, Indiana, Nebraska, UCLA, Miami, BYU. Miami just in the Elite Eight. Did they make it to the Final Four last year? I think I so. No, they made it, it to the Elite it, Eight. It was a weird Final Four, yeah. to be sure. Yeah. So, you know, no, no one would consider them, you know, a top four or top eight team last year. But getting that far is getting that far, and they want to go back. And, uh -huh. you know, if, coming from a school that hasn't made the second weekend of the tournament since 1999, the Clinton administration, it's – you can see where that logic from Perkins came from. If 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 making it deep into March is his goal, and it, that is the goal for most players, it's it's understandable. It's logical to look around the Iowa City and say that might not be happening here, at least while I'm here. Sure. It's understandable. So looking at this list, there are some suitors here that would make a lot of sense. Jim Laranega, of course, the the coach at, at Miami as well. UCLA, a ton of history there, though they've been down recently. Arkansas, seems like they're interested in literally everybody in the portal. But um, with with all of that said, I, I think Tony has some, some options out there that would probably be a better fit for him in his last year of college ball. And why not take advantage? You know, I, I don't I don't blame him one iota. I, I think Ultimately, it's it's probably going to be best for him. For Iowa, they are wearing thin in the backcourt. You've got two scholarship guards on the roster now going into next season, which are Josh Dix and Brock Harding. Both very encouraging seasons. This last year, Josh Dix starting to look like he could be one of the better scorers in the Big Ten. Brock Harding will probably be a starting caliber guard um, here sooner rather than later. But you can't play them both 40 minutes a night, right? That's just not feasible. So, and well, additionally, they don't have a guard, like I said, coming in the 2024 class, a scholarship guard coming in in the 2024 class. So we knew they were going to have to go portaling this offseason, but now they really have to hit the portal. They really have to hit the portal. Yeah, the the depth situation in the backcourt is something that really needs to be aggressively fixed and, and not just in a get another freshman kind of way or, or get a walk on or, or, or even, you know, get a kid who's going to give you five, 10 minutes a game. Iowa needs ballers in the backcourt for 2024, 25 and beyond. Like they need star caliber play from their guards. And if Brock Harding and, and Josh Dix are, are the only two guys that are going to be on scholarship next year, I mean, we're talking about Harding who gets about eight, 10 minutes a game and, and still has some growth 
to get to that Big Ten level. Uh, Josh Dix made that leap himself, but, you know, in this current transfer portal era, NIL era, where you can just go wherever you want, Iowa needs to make sure that Dix is well taken care of enough to assure that he's going to come back too. That is, that's, it's an open question at this point. And, and without a sort of a framework for, you know, how these commitments are going to work, uh, how, you know, whether you can or can enter, you know, enter the portal and, and whether or not there's going to be some eligibility um, penalty for that. Like until that's all resolved, Josh Dix might just say, oh, by the way, uh, USC is giving me three million. See you guys later. Yeah, and, and, and that's not a specific thing that I've heard or anything like that. But it's, you know, for as much potential as, as he's flashed this season, this past season. And for his youth and, and for a kid who, you know, made the under 20 team USA to, uh, roster prior to this season. No, he didn't. His, well, he uh, uh, sorry, made the trial. <laughs> okay. made, made the trial. Didn't make the roster. Sorry. Misinformation. Oh, God. <laughs> Demonetized. Uh, like, no, he tried out, you know, got that feedback from coaches. And, and it was a, a very formative experience for him when we talked to him at media day. That's a taste of the big time. And that is something that he can parlay into, you know, interest from other big time programs. So all of that is still on the table in terms of where that backcourt situation is going to come from next year. And, and if Fran is, again, if Fran is not aggressive in getting backcourt talent in, if you're Josh Dix, do you look around and say, Hey, like, I know I'm good enough to start on a 21 team. I, and if that's not going to be here, you know, make sure it's somewhere else. That is, that's a situation that college sports are in, that Iowa basketball is in right now. It's, you got to make sure everybody wants to come back. Everybody. Now, for those who watched the final game of the NIT for Iowa uh, they fell to Utah in the second round, 91 to 82 in Salt Lake City. You could kind of get a sense that 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 this was ultimately going to be Tony Perkins plans. Uh, he didn't seem all that engaged. I think he finished one of five from the floor. He and Peyton Sanford combined to go two of 16, which that doesn't exactly reflect Peyton. Just a tough night shooting for him. But you could see it body language wise, in my opinion, on on Tony and uh the season came to a close, and if that was any indication as to what the 2023-2024 season was like, um, you'd think it would have been would have turned out worse than it was. But uh, there were moments, you know, um, the the stretches of games. They beat Michigan State. They beat Northwestern right on the road, um, but ultimately it does come to an end in the NIT and. But the way this roster is currently constructed and what they're losing going into the offseason, I mean, I've kind of already said it, but and we've already said it. They better be active in the portal. I mean, Ross, I, I don't know if you have any real strong takeaways from that NIT game or, or this season, but that's really where I've ended up right now is they've got a great 2024 recruiting class coming in, but the portal is where you're going to make your team go into the next season. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Uh, you know, the the class they have is good. It's also small. It's two guys, uh, and they're both, I believe, kind of front court players, or, or Todd was more of a wing, um, or can play on the wing, whatever. Uh, but the backcourt is a big question mark, and I was losing, you know, even even before today, you know, they lost Bowen. Uh, Cricky's gone. Uh, Patrick McCaffrey is, is done at Iowa. Um, there's just a lot of... They need more guys in anyway, and now with Perkins leaving, that need is just exacerbated, especially uh, because it, it's happening in an area where they don't have guys coming in already. You know, there's no, like you said, there's no no freshman guards coming in, um, and there's no one, like, on the roster that was hurt this year that's going to be back next year. It's it's Harding, it's Dix, and then it's walk-ons. So they have got to hit the portal, and – you know, you've mentioned this in your articles uh, about this situation recently, and it's it's dead on. But they have to do better in the portal than they did last year when they were addressing front court depth 
uh, problems and came away with Cricky and Evan, uh, even, is it Evan Bronze? It's, Evan, yeah. It's Evan, yeah. <laughs> Evan. He just spells it weird then. All right. Yeah. Uh, fair. Uh, can't have yeah, him right so, now. <laughs> even Steven. Um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, the, you know, that was their haul last year. Uh, the production from those two this year was, I think not what fans were hopefully hoping to get when they came in last year. Uh, they just, they got to have, you know, Adam said it, they got to have some ballers. They got to have some dudes. Uh, you know, they need guys, not just that are going to eat up some minutes. So when Josh Hart, you know, when Brock Harding, sorry, is on the bench and Josh Dix, I just combine them into one player. We're, we're down to one guard now, guys. We're really <laughs> in trouble. Um, when Brock Harding and Josh Dix need a break, you know, it, it's more than that. They need guys that can actually, you know, push those guys for playing time and, uh, you know, give some really meaningful contributions here. Uh, and that's going to be interesting because the guys that can do that, there's going to be a lot of other teams after them too. It's not like I was going to be shopping, uh, the only one shopping in that particular marketplace. So that's going to be a very challenging, I think. Yes. And whether or not, of course, there's conversation constantly on Twitter regarding how much money the, the basketball team has in terms of what they get from Swarm and how they allocate it and, and all of that stuff. Of course, that'll come uh, into uh, it, it'll be a part of the the equation here. So we'll see what they're able to to get out of the portal. Um, of course, you can follow along with us on iwithoutrivals.com. For all of that inside information, go ahead and subscribe. We will be following the portal this entire offseason. And uh, you can, you can, like I said, you can subscribe there. A bunch of information coming here sooner rather than later, I'm sure. But, excuse me, <clears throat> all that said, is there even that much more to be said on the men's team? I, I don't think there's there's much more to hit other than that those two big things. Ross, did you have anything? I, no, I mean, that's obviously the big news. I think this is just going to be a really just critically important, uh, you know, period in the transfer portal for Iowa. Like if they are not successful uh, this this spring, it's going to set things up in a put things in a really difficult position next winter for that team, I think. Um, so, yeah, what, what it's going to be really big uh, what the basketball program is able to do over the next I don't know, three, four weeks, whatever. Elliot, you got something? Nope. Oh. Uh, nope. Adam, you got oh. something? Yeah, the, the the one thing that I, I, I just wanted to say is um, there was a lot of fan backlash uh, against the seniors this season. Uh, Tony and, and Patrick McCaffrey sort of got uh, the brunt of that, and there's, there's going to be a lot of fans who are happy that Tony Perkins will not be back next year. And on some level, I get that. At the same time, even if you want to be aspirational about where Iowa men's basketball's future is, Tony Perkins would have helped Iowa win more basketball games next year than if he's not going to be on the roster. He was a critically important contributor and I get that he was not consistent enough at his job, one, to lead Iowa to the tournament, and two, to, you know, sort of satisfy fans. But just because your best player is maybe not good enough, he is still a guy that Iowa is going to miss. He is still a guy who is going to help put wins on the scoreboard or, or the, I, I guess you don't put wins on the scoreboard who is going to put wins on in the correct column next year. And now I was got to figure out how it's going to get that production, get that experience, get that familiarity with a motion offense. Those, those are tough things to replace. Even if, you know, the way he went about it was sort of not championship level. It was still helpful. It was still productive. So Fran's got a big, big hole to fix, even if fans are happy that it's going to be somebody else wearing that jersey. So just 
like fans be careful what you wish for because it could get so much worse than 19 yeah. and 15 in an NIT bid. It could get so much worse. Yeah. I was just going to add that, you know, that's the one thing with Fran's program is that it's been a very developmental program since he's been here. It relies on guys staying for multiple years, developing, getting better. And then you really, you know, reap the rewards when they're upperclassmen. Um, and with Tony, you know, you, you got some of that, not as much as people wanted, but, you know, a fifth year Tony Perkins versus, you know, a plug and play guy uh, out of the portal, it, you know, it, it's going to have to be a really good guy out of the portal, I think, to be able to duplicate or improve on what Tony likely would have given you as a fifth year guy. Because um, I was not had a ton of success with just, you know, grabbing somebody out of the portal and then making an immediate impact. Um, you know, Kirk, he was up and down for, Rebracha took a couple a year to get better. I, I was um, just going to ask not a you. Huge, it's not a huge list either, frankly. So that that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just going to ask. Do you, do you think I was sort of been uh, spoiled by the success that Rebracha had coming from? I, I believe it was North Dakota State. Maybe it was North Dakota UND. Um, but like, he turned into an All Conference at the very least honorable mention by the end of his career, and. I think that sort of set an expectation of where like a guy like Cricky would be coming in. And man, like if that's sort of the limit for what I was going to get from a big out of the portal, like let's temper our expectations on, on that front too. Now, now fortunately guards are a little bit of a different animal than, you know, six, nine, six, ten guys in, in terms of how they can contribute right away and, and how they can sort of shape the, flow the game around their own skills but yeah it's going to be tough and you, you i'm sure fran mccaffrey would love to just hit the like go get michael jordan 2.0 button <laughs> right but it's like you said ross it's going to be an extremely competitive portal it's going to be a situation where guys are going to look at iowa and be like all right is that going to be my best bet in terms of postseason success, it, 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 are they my best suitor? And for where scouting is today, for where the portal is today, the guys that are going to get Iowa back to that 20-plus win mark, maybe even up to a 25 win mark, they're going to have a lot of competition in the transfer portal and a lot of money. It's going to be thrown at those dudes. So either I was going to be the beneficiary of a guy sort of getting passed over by everybody, or Fran's going to have to roll double sixes yet again in his recruiting. And he, we've seen him do it multiple times, but ooh, he's up against the wall on this one, isn't he? What do we, what do we say every year around the NCAA tournament? Who wins games in the tournament? Guards. Guards. What is Fran not known for developing? Guards. Both of those things combined going to make it real difficult to land somebody in the portal. Real difficult because those big schools, those big basketball schools are going to be saying guards win us games. And those this, those NIL collectives are going to say, okay, here's $500,000. Go get them. What they do with Joe Chassant? <laughs> and and look who's in the tournament now it's you know joey toots he there are basketball for uh, uh factories elliot like you said that can look at a guy like toussaint and say we can win games with that guy he whatever role he had at iowa was clearly not the best fit but just because somebody does not work out perfectly at iowa does not mean that they can't be part of the tournament formula so iowa has to keep that in mind too that Man, if Joe Toussaint's getting six digits in the NIL transfer portal market, all right, then if I was offering six digits, they better be they better understand that they're gonna be maybe getting a guy of Joe Toussaint caliber. And there were again plenty of fans who were happy to see Joey Toots leave Iowa City when he transferred out to uh West Virginia. And so far it's been uh, you know, he went from Virginia to or West Virginia to Texas Tech. So far, it's been working out kind of great for him. So, again, understand what the market is in that transfer portal. Understand that it's not like you can't just say, here's 
25 cents now go be a first team all big 10 guy like there is a correlation between how much iowa spends on nil and the talent coming in that that's just going to be the case going forward and they have to address that in a really big way this offseason really big way that's it so on to the women Headed to the Sweet 16 once again after their victory over West Virginia last night. And boy, oh boy, has the Twitter response been something. I'm not going to delve into it unless you want to, Adam, because this is your beat. But I'm going to go right to you here. Initial thoughts after the win, during the game. Like, what were the big takeaways from this one? Well, during the game, it was, well, one, the atmosphere was incredible, and it was yet another game at Carver-Hawkeye Arena, the, the last game at Carver-Hawkeye Arena for the seniors like uh, Gabby Marshall, Kate Martin, and little-known guard Caitlin Clark. And sure enough, the Hawkeye fans showed up, showed out, sustained noise over 100 decibels several times yet again. I mean, that hurts my ear. <laughs> at one point, I had my earbuds in just like, so something could act like earplugs just for my own hearing's sake. Uh, so the atmosphere was incredible. It was a competitive game, just like everybody expected up to and including the, the uh, Iowa players in the scouting report. And there was a little bit of controversy about the officiating, especially in that fourth quarter when 14 of Iowa's 16 points came at the free throw line. At the same time, it's West Virginia and their press defense. Their entire game plan was to ugly it up, and it almost worked. And the only reason it didn't work is not because the officials were calling 27 fouls on West Virginia compared to 11 for Iowa, because that reflected both of their styles of play for the game. It was because West Virginia was not hitting jumpers, and that is not the officials' fault. I didn't see one referee block any of those three pointers that bounced off the iron. All right. It was Gabby Marshall, not a referee who blocked that shot that led to sit of Fulters and one that ended up giving Iowa the lead that they didn't relinquish. Like Iowa went out and won that game in a tough situation. The officiating, some of those were tough calls, but officiating is tough. Like this this cannot be anybody's first experience with iffy refereeing in the women's game, especially like men is barely better. But watching that game live, I didn't see a whole lot of calls that should have gone the other way, whether they were against Iowa, whether they were against West Virginia. Most of them looked about right. And there were several instances where I looked at the folks around me on press row and it was like, are they really not calling that? And, and it was West Virginia playing that physical defense. If anything, the referees could have called 40-plus fouls on West Virginia. That's the way they played, and it has worked out great for them. And again, the formula kind of almost worked against Iowa. They And they would have been glad to take that free throw disparity if it meant a win. They would have been over the moon about it, and that would have been the blueprint to beat Iowa. It still kind of is. So what it comes down to is Iowa went out and won that game in a way that West Virginia didn't. And the people that sort of say, well, the refs, the refs stole it is a phrase that I saw on Twitter multiple times. And, and some of that is just sort of casual fans watching their first ever women's basketball game and, and thinking it, it's not fair. I don't like Caitlin Craig. Eh, okay. Say that all you want. Like Iowa still advancing. And in a way, it's sort of a like a all right, welcome to March. You can ugly the game up all you want. <laughs> and you're not gonna get the you know the superstar calls, like it, it, even saying that to Iowa, like Iowa is not going to get the superstar calls that like Caitlin Clark was getting for most of the regular season, even though they're big ten refs that were out there uh, for that game. And so when it came down to that crunch time, when it came down to those last five minutes after West Virginia had tied the game back up after scoring the first 10 points of the fourth quarter, you can you can go ahead and you know point fingers at everybody else, but that was a five-minute pressures on, like it, it turned into a five-minute game. Iowa was the one that took control of that game from there. 
and not West Virginia. West Virginia played great. I, I They deserved a whole lot better than an eight seed, and they deserved a whole lot of an easier second round opponent than the Hawkeyes. Bar none, flat out. Like, that's a good, good team. But Iowa earned it. West Virginia didn't. That's gonna that's tough news to the Mountaineer fans. It's tough news to Cyclone fans who have had nothing, you know, but Caitlin Clark to focus on since they lost to Stanford. Uh tough news for Nebraska fans who think that Caitlin Clark isn't the reason that Iowa's popular. But that's what it comes down to. Iowa as a one seed on its home floor said, We're not gonna lose this game. We've been in these tough situations before many times. And they went ahead and won. Uh, what did you guys see on TV? Because, like, one, I didn't see any of the telecasts, and two, these are ESPN telecasts, and ESPN didn't really cover this team all year, and they like to sort of push the drama, you know, for the casuals, the and, and all that. How did ESPN treat this telecast, guys? It was it was all about Iowa all the time. I they did little briefs on Caitlin and Cade and Gabby and maybe some stuff on Lisa Bluter here, but uh, they didn't exactly act like West Virginia was getting screwed over either. I think that was only Twitter. Um, I mean, Ross, did you gather that? I, I didn't, I didn't like the way Twitter reacted, I think is just a sort of, so my, well, let me illustrate this with a story. My sister is not into sports like at all. She messaged me this morning and said that she saw on Twitter or on some social media that Caitlin Clark is whiny or something like that. And I, what I, my response was is that people like to hate greatness. People hated Michael Jordan. People hate LeBron James. People hated Tom Brady. Ask 12 year old Elliot. I hated Tom Brady. The strong <laughs> respect for him now because I'm a mature adult. And I think that's how the response should go with Caitlin. Sure. Watching on TV. I mean, I've seen her live too. Sometimes it can be a bit much, but she's a superstar. She's supposed to get superstar calls and she wasn't getting them. And I mean, I, I think the response largely is one silly immaturity and hating greatness and, and two uh, trolls. I, I really think yeah. it's, it's, it's that, um, Anyway, regarding the broadcast, I, I thought it was fairly well-tempered. Obviously, they're going to focus on Iowa because they have literally the greatest women's basketball player ever. Like, are, are we, can we be realistic about it? It's just, it's genuinely, like, silly to me. I was watching, and this conversation can take a whole new turn, but we'll, we'll revert back to this after what I say here. The conversation about Caitlin Clark not being a role model just is asinine asinine you're telling uh, players can't swear when they're on the basketball court oh my are you freaking kidding me and i so said it much more graphically to the people in my personal life that were asking about it anyway go ahead ross it's just the most bad faith argument it's just ridiculous it's it, it it's i mean i understand why people you know, interact with it to dunk on it because, oh, this is so stupid. But it's like, it's, it's giving oxygen to that is just so needless and so pointless because it's it's utter nonsense just perpetrated by trolls and idiots. And it's like, and it's sexist too. I mean, she's doing the same thing that Jordan did, that Kobe did, but she has a ponytail and is a woman so it's not acceptable the way it was for them and it, you know that part of it is just ridiculous as well but yeah i mean the idea of her not being a role model i mean try telling that to the five thousand girls at that game last night or the millions literal millions tuning into that game uh there was a report that came out this afternoon that that game a monday night uh, second round game in the NCAA women's tournament drew 4.9 million viewers, which is an astounding number for any tournament game, let alone, you know, the second round game. Uh, like, yeah, like, I don't think that role model thing is 
is worth the time of day, honestly. And I, I regret talking about it as much as we have. Elliot. I'm right there with you. Tell that to all the, the kids that she visited in the Stead Family Children's Hospital over her. Yeah. In Iowa State. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the yeah. thing about kids is they don't listen to any of these arguments. They they don't care whether adults think that she's a role model or not. They don't care. And if if they didn't think that Caitlin Clark was aspirational, they wouldn't be showing up. I guarantee you that. They, they would not be bothering their parents to to go and, and see those games. They don't care whether or not jackasses think she's a role model or not. Not adults. No. <laughs> yeah. And, and and then to the to the point about her work in the referees, let's just zoom as far out as possible. Name me one star athlete who doesn't work the referees. Name there one. Is, <laughs> there is not one. <laughs> it is part of of knowing the game, like having the game slowed down for you to that level, kind of like probably slowed down more for Caitlin Clark than for the referees themselves. So like, and, and I think that is a constant for these guys. And, and here's a perfect example of that. Tim Duncan is like, in, in terms of being even keeled, in, in terms of like borderline aloof as, as a guy on and off the car, uh, court, soft-spoken, Work the referees like crazy. And he's also a guy who, at least when he was playing, and, and this might still be the case, and, and I think that this is instructive. He set some sort of NBA record on a uh, on a machine that tests your reflexes. And it, it like a like I don't know what it, what it's called. People can Google it and this and that. Um, but he had world-class reflexes and i think one that helps him be a great player but two it also helps him understand like oh no like i did get fouled you know like i got hit on my arm a tenth of a second before like i i you know got the ball off or, or something like that 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 level of reflexes is how the game has slowed down for him and because he has a better understanding of like how basketball works because the game is slower for him than it is for the referees. He will get on them for that because he knows it better than them. It's the same dynamic with Caitlin. You know, I, I don't know what her reflex machine test scores were or anything like that, but you know, it's going to be good one and two, it evinces that same understanding of the game at that high level. And you just want to say, Hey, look, I'm playing this game at a level that, you have ever seen the last thing i want is the referees to muck it up for me and all the you know fans and, and all the people watching and and so yeah it is a part of the game it is a part of greatness you better be right like no one wants to see somebody work in the referees when they're dead ass wrong 75 percent of the time <laughs> like that that's that's not fun that's you know dream on green but but we're not talking about that with Caitlin. Like it, it and and I guarantee you, with the amount of attention that she gets on social media, on TikTok, and this and that, if she were protesting incorrect calls with regularity, we would know it by now. That would be the whole uh, discourse around her by now is that she doesn't know the rules of the game. If she were protesting for no reason, so yeah, I, again. I almost feel bad engaging it to this level because Ross, like you said, it's bad faith by and large. It is bad faith, but they, but we also do need to sort of acknowledge that women's basketball fandom is still in its infancy for so many people, especially Iowa fans. And so they are acclimating themselves with this game as we speak and expect, you know, expecting them to understand that, Oh, well, Caitlin's, you know, arguing with referees because this is what all-star athletes do. You, you guys and I both know that, or all know that already. Maybe not everybody does. And, and so engaging, or and, and so dismissing things without explaining why we're dismissing them to the most casual, to the most new fans of, of any age, almost does them a little bit of a disservice. So I just wanted to, you know, make sure that that understanding of what star athletes are all about wanted to make sure that that was said but yeah with all that uh, 
in, in terms of giving any voice to any of these arguments in particular, uh, that that's not going to be a worthwhile use of time because yeah, it's bad faith. It, it's people trolling for attention, radio hosts, people who, who absolutely know better. And at some point, like it, it, if, if the way that you want to get attention is to just mimic a shithead, there goes our demonetization again, and people can't tell the difference, then you're just being a shithead. And, it, you know, women's basketball doesn't really need more shitheads now, especially like volunteer, bad faith. Oh, I'm just doing it for yucks. Like, take it somewhere else. Take it to the NBA. Like, this is this is a moment that really deserves good faith. So I, I hope we get more of that, he says, as he's about to go log back onto Twitter. So that's <laughs> that's the end of my rant. So I think you alluded it, alluded to it. Adam, what this does is what I guess what it shows is that the women's game is growing, right? That's the silver lining here. Um, I mentioned jackasses and you mentioned shitheads. Well, they're jumping on board now. We had them all for football. <laughs> and now that you know that cynical bs is starting to come along with women's basketball and it's because of the greatness of caitlin clark and it's because of the greatness of players like cameron brink and audie crooks and angel reese that these folks have come out of the woodwork to, to watch women's basketball and that's ultimately a good thing right ultimately a good thing the women's game is continuing to grow it'll follow caitlin clark to the wnba He'll probably follow Addie Deal to to Iowa and Cali Levin in the twenty four class. I don't follow women's recruiting like like Adam and and Braden do for us at Iowa.rivals.com, which you should follow along, of course. But uh, it, it's it's going to continue to grow, and in the skill set and the shooting and the scoring and the athleticism, we're going to continue to see it grow for for women's basketball as well. Um, they will take on Colorado in the Sweet Sixteen in Albany. Adam, you'll be there. I don't know how much you've looked into uh, that Colorado matchup, but I think we talked about it right when the selection show, like after the selection show happened on the podcast. Colorado was a team that looked like they could have been a one seed and then they had injuries and kind of fell off. So is this another indication of Iowa having probably one of the toughest regionals in the in the country here? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, like you mentioned, Colorado sort of tailed off at the end of the season. And so they they, they slipped to a five seed. And there was one stretch where uh, they played uh, Oregon State at home. Oregon State was a three seed. And then three straight road games against Stanford, UCLA, and USC. Of course they lost all of them. But <laughs> that is a murderous stretch of basketball. And if Iowa had come out of that, if this Iowa team had come out of that stretch at two and two, they'd have been doing cartwheels. So, yeah, a, a bit of a tough stretch for the Buffaloes. But by and large, when you when you look at that team and and look at a team that had been really trending as a one or a two seed uh, going into that um, that stretch of play. Oh, I'm sorry, it was it was a road game against Utah, not against Stanford. Uh, We'll make sure the record's corrected there. But, you know, Utah is another uh, top 25 team. Uh, they, they were a high seed, too. And they just sort of ran into a scheduling buzzsaw. And, you know, we're, we're talking about a team that had started the season something close to like 20 and one was in that top five. I think they got as high as top two. Number two was cursed this year. So we understand that you know it, it's not a situation where i was going up against a team that doesn't have the juice like th th this isn't a mid-major makes good sort of situation like like gets by with a with a easy schedule but um yeah by and large colorado's defense is difficult their size is going to cause a problem or it's going to cause problems for the Hawkeyes and you know they they don't play like West Virginia they're they're not going to I think they they they, they force 10 steals a game they do play defense but it's not going to be the like beat the hell out of me <laughs> sort of situation uh so it, it's going to be a tough matchup 
Absolutely. Uh, Iowa's going to be happy that it is on a, I mean, and they're not going to be happy that it's away from Iowa City, but they're going to be happy that it's not in Boulder. That's going to be in a neutral site and it, technically closer to Iowa City than Colorado in Albany. So it's still going to be a uh, friendlier crowd. But yeah, Colorado's going to pose a tough test, especially if they're playing like the Colorado of, you know, January, December, that 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 first half of the season. Uh, Ross, what have you sort of seen about the Buffaloes so far? Were, were you able to, to watch any of the um, Colorado KSU game this weekend? I did, and I think there was a stretch in that game where both teams were unable to score for several yeah. minutes, which was not good. Uh, but uh, they are overall a very good team, obviously. Um, you know, deserving of their uh, five seed, um, possibly deserving of more. But, you know, as you mentioned, they had that uh, skid towards the end of the season that definitely hurt them uh, in terms of the seeding. Uh, but, I mean, the top half of the Pac-12 this year was just – absolutely loaded um stanford ucla usc colorado uh utah uh, they were a four seed or five seed uh they lost to gonzaga last night i believe um just a lot of really good teams and you know i think emerging from that gauntlet was not easy and the buffaloes you know did a did a fair a great job from you know what they're able to do uh, I am interested in it from a matchup standpoint. Um, I think you mentioned the size and, you know, that's something Iowa didn't have to contend with, uh, with West Virginia. They were n- not a big team, um, but Colorado's got some, uh, got some posts that, uh, you know, Iowa, how, ma- how they match up with them will be a very interesting subplot in that game. I think um, the, you know, the West Virginia game, we saw a lot of Hannah Stolke, um, and she got the crap beat out of her by West Virginia. And, uh, you know, she came through, though, with double-double, some big free throws at the end of the game, just, you know, really hung in there and showed a, a lot of toughness in that game. But this might be a game where you need a little bit more Addison uh, O'Grady and uh, Sharon Goodman or A.J. Ettinger. Um, You just might need some more actual size, you know, to just kind of, match up with what the Buffaloes are, are doing down low. Um, uh, what do you make of the that matchup? So the, the one thing that I noticed from that KSU game, um, you know, uh, the, the Wildcats had uh, Yoki, Yoka Lee in the middle. And uh, there, there's a, a stretch like pretty close to the beginning of the game. Uh, Charlotte Whitaker, who's one of the, the bigs that the Buffaloes had, she was in there for about like a minute or two and immediately just picked up two fouls. She doesn't even start. Like we're, we're talking about a backup here, but, but she's a, you know, a, a bigger body. Let's see. She's listed at six, three and, and not small. And she just basically just went out there and tackled Lee. <laughs> and, you know, they, they've also got Vonley on the center, uh, Quay Miller, uh, a, a bigger forward and, and they play tough physical defense. Uh, Ross, I think you're right. It, it, this is going to be a situation where, like, I think Addie O'Grady is going to have to be at least a 15 minute, maybe even a 20 minute player, especially if Colorado is going big enough on that interior that maybe, maybe it makes sense for Iowa to have two bigs on the floor, you know, sort of move Stokey back to the floor. We haven't seen Bluter want to do that very often, especially after the the first few games of the season. Uh, when when they finally settled into that rotation. But when you look at, you know, who they have on the floor and you know, those bigger lineups for the Buffaloes, it might be a situation where you do want to go super big lineup, which, which we've rarely seen from Iowa this year, but we have seen uh, in very limited instances. So that's something that I'm going to be uh, keeping an eye on. Uh, whether or not Colorado's hitting their jump shots, Ross, like you mentioned, those – those cold stretches uh, are brutal basketball to watch. And, and Colorado has been sort of susceptible to them for, uh, you know, from time to time this season. Um, does Iowa get Colorado or are the Buffaloes going to heat up a little bit uh, on the wings, Buffalo hot wings? Yeah. Pretend I meant to do that. Uh, Ross has logged off the call. Uh, Elliot, uh, anything that you've 
sort of noticed about uh, this sort of situation or have you just sort of been underwater with men's basketball and football? Underwater, baby. <laughs> yeah. And all the recruiting coverage, i.e. recruiting analyst and host uh, yeah. with, with spring ball. No, I watch the women when they play and I uh, talk about it with you guys. That's all I got, guys. <laughs> Well, what do you want to see? Okay, so what do you want to see I would do better against Colorado that you thought they could have improved on against West Virginia? Gabby Marshall and Kate Martin hitting shots, getting involved. Yep. There, I tweeted about it, and not a whole lot of people engaged with it. I think it was because it was late in the game, but Gabby, I felt like, got into the paint pretty frequently, but it didn't result in a shot by her, like a floater or just a little midi. Um, I, I think she was hesitant for for whatever reason in that game uh she finished with zero points kate martin i thought there were a couple times where she passed up some open shots too and it was said on the broadcast and i wholeheartedly agree is if it's just caitlin versus everybody else and i'm 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 paraphrasing here then they're probably going to lose especially against some of these elite teams because you can like number one basketball 101 is you cannot ball watch you cannot just stand around and watch the ball, and that's what they did a little bit against this West Virginia team. They run into a physical team like that with a lot more talent that's going to hit some shots. They could they could have lost that game by 20 against a really good basketball team. Like, if we're being honest, someone that has a wing that doesn't shoot the ball from the right side of her head and just launch it, that was just – that took me off guard when I was watching. I couldn't tell you who's, what the player's name was, but – that's a, a situation that needs to be rectified in this next game in terms of Gabby and Kate's involvement. Um, Molly Davis coming back would obviously be be massive, and it would have been massive last night in terms of having another ball handler. Uh, yeah, I want to see yeah. more from from Kylie Fearbach and and Sydney rose to the occasion, but but she's another player that you can get her involved. Your offense is going to be better. Um, and Hannah just kind of looked off last night. Uh, I think ten points, ten rebounds is what she finished with, something like that. It, but, it was a double double, but yeah, she was battling, she, battling. Yeah, she could have. She missed a few layups. She she could have finished probably with twenty and ten. Um, but yes, battling. Some folks, uh, again, make it brief. Posted a video of her going back and forth with what's her name that she was matched up with from West Virginia, the center, where they got locked and were like, "This is I don't know how this is a foul on West Virginia." Meanwhile, Hannah hit her face on the ground. <laughs> like, so that's just to illustrate the the matchup last night. Um, that's that's pretty much my my main takeaway. Uh, Caitlin was was Caitlin, of course, and um, they've they've got to they've got to have more from the supporting cast. That's that's it uh, against Colorado on Saturday. Yeah, I I would agree and. You know, watching that game, that was just one of the strangest, I think, wins for Iowa because four players scored all of the points. Like, that's weird. They got zero bench points. They got zero points out of Marsh Gabby. They got not that many out of Kate Martin. I mean, the normal um, supporting cast did not show up on the on the scoreboard in that game. And, you know, that's why... It, a big part of why it was such a grind to try and get that win was because, you know, Caitlin had half the points and then it was uh, Kate Martin, Stolke and, uh, and a Folter, the other three players that, you know, they were the only three that scored points. Uh, I guess they had the other 32. Um, you know, that was just a very bizarre way to win a game. And it's not something that seems that I, that I would, I would be able to duplicate, you know, I, I should not use that as a formula for any games going forward, I would say, nor, nor would they want to. Uh, but I, they just, they have to have that, that help from the supporting cast. They need other players to hit shots. That was the other thing. Kalen was the only player that hit a three pointer last night. Uh, and the only other game where that was the case, I believe Adam had this in his recap uh, was the K state, the first K state game this year. And Iowa lost that game. Like, Iowa needs other players to hit shots and help out on offense as, you know, otherworldly as Caitlin is. She cannot do it by herself. It's funny that you should mention 
all of that, Ross, because I got an opportunity to ask Jan Jensen about that after the game, basically that exact question. It was, you know, West Virginia got what they wanted out of Iowa's production. That was their blueprint. They got it. I, Iowa had seven assists as a team on like 16 or 17 made shots. Seven as a team. Caitlin usually gets more than that by herself. Uh, tied her season low for assists, and this was in my recap too. And, and again, that season low came in that loss to K-State too. West Virginia had their whole blueprint, and it came from Manhattan, Kansas. And again, if they hit their jumpers, Iowa's out. And South Carolina is more capable of hitting jumpers than, say, West Virginia is. And South Carolina is also capable of playing that kind of defense too. So, I mean, Iowa really cannot afford to play like that if it makes it to places like, I don't know, Cleveland for the Final Four. Uh, but going back to the point, uh, so I asked Jan, like, are you thinking we've got a lot to improve? Are you happy? And she she basically said, like, I'm 0% we have a lot to improve at this moment. Like they're going to go back, they're going to try to fix things, but by and large, they look at the fact that they just took on West Virginia, got West Virginia's best game, like one of the best defenses in the nation, only turned the ball over 15 times, which, you know, sounds tough, but you got to remember West Virginia forces like 24 a game. And and so, uh, like, yeah, I'm disappointed at the moment at some of it, but I'll, I'll take 15 turnovers against him. I'm I'm more thrilled, and, and especially, you know, in this, everyone's like, just survive in advance and, and worry about it later. Um, I'm pretty sure Colorado does some press like that, but I'm not. I'm just watching them, is what she said. So they're over the moon with how that game went, even though, like, formulaically, it was not Iowa basketball. All they wanted was the win, and that's what they got. And now they're on to these neutral courts. They don't have the like, oh my God, we have to win at home pressure anymore. It's going to be a different pressure, but they don't have to like worry about sending fans or like Carver fans home empty. They don't have to worry about a disaster anymore. Fans still want them to go to the final four. Fans are still going to be upset if they like only air quotes here, only make the sweet 16 or only make the elite eight, but they all they wanted was the dub and that's what they got and they will not harbor any of this well well what if we blah 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 that's not the way they're thinking in that locker room so that is that's what they're taking to albany is just a like all right next one up <laughs> and, and it, it really is that simple to them or at the very least that's what they're telling me is that simple all right uh, you who they think you get, or who do you guys think they're going to play in the Elite Eight, assuming they beat Colorado, LSU, or UCLA? Probably UCLA, but we've seen LSU just get kissed on the forehead time and time again. We've seen Kim Mulkey get kissed on the forehead time and time again. And if she wants to rally, uh, uh, Adam, don't even don't even go there. <laughs> I mean, if. <laughs> I, I, I would say UCLA also, but if LSU plays the way they did in the second half of that uh, Middle Tennessee game, their second round opponent, they're going to be tough to beat because they absolutely uh, took Middle Tennessee to the woodshed in in that half and just dominated them to a, a astounding degree. And you know, they're Middle Tennessee, UCLA, not quite the same thing. So they're going to have you know a significant challenge against the Bruins but that that LSU team was the first glimpse I, you know when I've seen them this year when they looked like oh yeah that was the team that won the national title last year um they're still pretty darn good Elliot you got something Ross your mic it would just went crazy that entire answer um just like fuzzy so maybe unplug and plug it back in while while we're talking here um it was but, just for that one. That that was the only one that had happened on. Yes. Yes. Are you in agreement with everything he said there, Adam? Yeah, for the most part. It, you know, it, it's it's a situation where we've seen what LSU can do. We they know like Iowa likes to talk about their experience from years past. 
LSU now has the experience of winning the national championship, of, of being on that highest level and, you know, playing out of their minds, banking in three pointers. It's, it was flukish what they did to Iowa, but it still happened. And they still have that data, that muscle memory. So, you know, I don't want to see Iowa versus LSU. I'm sure the networks do because it would pop a rating that women's basketball has probably never seen before. Like, it, I can see why ESPN wants it. I can see why these storylines exist. I don't want to cover that game. <laughs> I, I don't want that headache again because so much of it is not about basketball. Iowa UCLA, one, would be better basketball. And two, it would be so free of the BS. At the very least, it would like the foreseeable BS, the BS that we can see coming. Um, so I would like to see that. And I think UCLA is just better. Like Lauren Betts is a menace on the interior. And they, they just have ballers down there. And, and UCLA has proven it against a tough conference all year. So if that matters, then I, I think it's going to be UCLA. I think it's going to be by double digits. But Iowa does also have to get by Colorado first, and that's not a sure thing. So my guess is it's Iowa-UCLA. And that will be real difficult because UCLA can use its size to its advantage too and has had a bunch of experience doing it in that like very taller Pac-12 that they've got going on. So if I had to guess, that's it. Uh, Elliot, what do you think? Sure. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. I can well, tell you, you all. What do you tell... want? Who do I want? Um, yeah, who, do, who, who would you rather see? Would you rather see Iowa LSU 2.0 or well, a new I've, opponent? I've never seen UCLA play. Um, obviously... I I, I kind of do want to see LSU Iowa 2.0 because yes, like last year's national championship was such a fluke in so many ways. Officiating was god awful, god awful, and of course those shots going in for LSU. Um, they've got so much talent on that team, but they've had their issues. So yeah, I I I don't really have a a stake in the game, I guess. But if uh, Either way, whatever happens, I'll I'll be watching. I can tell you that. Um, I was gonna say I can tell you all about Iowa's twenty twenty twenty. Excuse me, twenty twenty five perspective recruiting class for football. But ask me about UCLA and LSU women's basketball or men's basketball for that matter, and I'm not gonna be able to give you a great answer. Um, but which, by the way, for you those uh, recruiting folks out there who do pay attention and might be out of the loop on Twitter, Zay Robinson just committed to Iowa State about ten minutes ago. So yeah. um, wide receiver from West Des Moines Valley, one of the more coveted players in the state has some, had some injury injury history, but he is a stud. And uh, as long as he can stay healthy, the Iowa state will be really, really happy with him. Um, but nice kid too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Zay's a great kid. But speaking of football, let's move on here to the press conference from today. Kirk Ferentz talks with the media prior to the, uh, the schedule for us for for spring ball and we got to learn a little bit about tim lester about the caden proctor situation and and some more adam of course going to be writing about caden proctor and what we learned there uh my piece from today's presser was about tim lester and, and how things are going for the offense along with the quarterbacks who is going to head the ship there for for iowa on the field and we do have some inside intel on, on how things are going in practice, which you can check out at iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet. I shared that on Twitter the other day, but uh, all the details are there on, on our premium board at iowa.rivals.com. Now, for me, the number one takeaway was that quote from, from KF today uh, about Tim Lester and how things are going in terms of installing the, the offense. And I'll read it to you verbatim. Basically, we're just, excuse me. Basically, we're just taking his playbook material and going with it. And if that isn't encouraging, I don't know what is. Of course, I think a lot of folks fall into the boat of let me see it before I believe in it. But a lot of things that I've heard line up with that. And to hear that out of Kirk Ferentz's mouth, which of course you can 
not always guarantee it's it's going to be something that you can take to the bank that you can expect to see on the field from from Kirk in a press conference but um that's that's encouraging Ross what do you think in in that department as as someone who who you know read my article edited my article yeah no I agree um do I sound okay I hope yes, yes. Um, that's just, just about to slide back yeah go ahead <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I thought it was encouraging and it was, you know, the proof is in the pudding and the, the pudding comes in Mar in the fall. So until then, all we can go on is, you know, their public statements, but this is exactly what you were hoping to hear Kirk Ferentz say about Tim Lester and, you know, the rebuilt Iowa offense it is, you know, if it's not Tim Lester being given, you know, the full control of the keys to the car it sounds like he's got a lot of control. Um, and I think that's what people are, are hoping and wanting to see is an offense that doesn't, you know, look like, you know, the same old Iowa offense. And that doesn't look like what Kirk Ferentz has been, you know, pushing for the last, you know, two decades. Um, so if Tim Lester is able to modernize that offense and, you know, change it and, uh, you know, bring some new ideas into uh, the locker room and into the playbook. That's a tremendously exciting thing um, because obviously anyone who watched Iowa the last couple of years knows those, those new ideas are, are much, much needed. Um, so I, I think based on, you know, what you got out of Kirk today about Lester, it's, it's, it's incredibly encouraging. Now, again, it's words, it's March, uh, almost April, I guess, still March. And we're not going to know for sure until that team takes the field in September exactly what this, you know, new Iowa offense looks like, what it can do. But, you know, for where we're at right now, I was I was pleased with what we heard. I thought it was exactly what you wanted to hear at this point in time. Adam, did you see things any differently? Yeah, I, I, more or less, I'm in the same boat as you. And and a sort of a common response has been, well, let, let's see what it looks like in September. Well, all right, but you know, we can't really speed up the calendar any. So you know, on, on some level, the the folks who say, well, well, let me see them in September. All right, go ahead and hibernate through the summer. Uh, in, in terms of what we're able to see here, there was one little bit out of Kirk that sort of caught my ear, and he was talking about the process of installing Lester's offense, the, the the sort of RPO situation, which has not really been in, I, I, I was going to say this metaphorically, but it, it's pretty clearly literally true, uh, because I, I was going to say it's not been in their metaphorical vocabulary. But one thing that he said was, and and, and I'll read off of the, the quotes here, um, it's been a process, though. We're trying to install something each and every day. It's been challenging, I think, for everybody, and myself included, just learning the language and all that type of thing and trying to keep up. We're doing that and seeing how the install is going in, then also see how the players are handling uh, all that and where it all ends up. We'll see at the end of spring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and yeah, that part is true. But let's remember, Kirk Ferentz is not particularly up on RPOs and, and the intricacies of them traditionally he he's he's learning he's learning but this is this is going to be an adjustment for him too for the head coach and so yeah you you kind of wanted him to be up on this 15 years ago right like but but it's it, it's the uh the the apocryphal chinese um uh, proverb it's not actually a chinese proverb but people like to say it is but the, the the fake Chinese proverb is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. Kirk Ferentz is planting that RPO tree now. All right. He, he chose the next best time to do it. So we, we we do have to understand that this is going to be an installation process. And, and hopefully it's not going to be the same sort of 18 month, you know, learn a brand new language sort of situation that was going on with Brian Ferentz's playbook. And by all indications, that is not going to be the case. And and I think Iowa understands, especially after the success of, you know, guys like, I don't know, Michael Penix Jr., that you do want guys to be able to walk onto campus, read your playbook, 
and go contribute year one. And for so long, we had heard that that's not the way that things operate in Iowa City. Well, those days are over. And, and so it is, it's sort of a brand new era again. And, and Kirk's had a few of these now. And, and he has been, for as stodgy as he is, for as um, lower C conservative as, as he is, in, just in terms of what goes on on the football field, we're not talking politics, but like in, in terms of that, like practical to a fault, Kirk Ferentz, he has been a little bit more able to change with the changing tides of college sports than, let's just throw out a different name here, Fran McCaffrey. Kirk 5.0 or, or whatever version of Kirk this is, the the, the RPO Kirk, you know, there's transfer portal Kirk, there, there was um, new, like, uh, riverboat Kirk, like, they, they're, there's so many different Kirks that have happened. He does, at the very least, understand that his ability to stay a an effective college football coach means that 20th century offensive concepts are just not going to cut it anymore. And he's never going to come right out and say those words in that order, especially to, you know, jag offs like us sitting there with our, you know, phones and earning 1% of his salary. But, you know, this is sort of the way that he cops to that publicly. This, this is the Kirk Ferentz way of, of saying, yeah, that's what we're doing. So Iowa fans should be encouraged. They should not think that this is going to be a one-day install that's going to work perfectly because that's that's not the way any playbook works in football. And and that's not a Kirk Ferentz you know, reflection. That is a college football reaction or a reflection. But they understand the task in front of them. They understand that trying to squeak out wins when you'd score 14 points is not sustainable and it's not the way that you get to championship football which remains their goal um uh, elliot I, I did ask um kirk about the quarterbacks and, and what their sort of development goals were did not really get a substantive answer but it you know it, it is a situation where the quarterbacks sort of have to be involved in that transition and they're learning along with Kirk. And that too is going to be a process, especially with Kate McNamara hurt again, injured, you know, like recovering from surgery again. So that will throw its own wrinkles into this, but, but what did you think about one, his comments is especially in, in terms of the install process and, and to sort of what it means for the team. Well, in terms of the install process, regarding what you just said a moment ago about scoring, scoring 14 points and kind of hoping to win, we did get the complimentary football quote during oh, that's never, season. that's never going away. <laughs> I will say, I will say he said in regards to Tim and, and how things are meshing, he said, I think it's going to look different regarding the offense, but I think philosophically we're in line. Not that it was a prerequisite, but he has been a head coach and I think he understands how all three things function together. We played good defense here pretty much 20 plus years. That was a building block coming in. That's been a big part of the blueprint, I I guess. Stats are great and all that, but the most important stat is winning games. And that has been first and foremost. My visits with Tim, I think that's where he's at too. He thinks the same way and he gets it and he gets how things work together. So that was, that gave me a little bit of pause, but all in all, to hear that they are installing his playbook, to hear some of the things that that we've heard that you can read about on on the premium board, is encouraging. I I as optimistic as I can be, while also tampering expectations is kind of where I'm currently at, because, I mean, I'll say it again. I'll I'll believe it when I see it. September comes around and. They're playing an actual power five football team and and we'll we'll see if it if it comes to fruition. Uh regarding they got, personnel. They, they they have a doozy of a September too. It, <laughs> like the um Illinois happen. State, Troy. Yeah. I think they play Western Michigan again. There's Iowa State. And and I Iowa think State. their their last September game is is that the uh, Ohio State trip? I or don't... is that prior to the um by week 
I think that's prior to the bye week. I'm pulling or, it up or, or after the bye week. Or yeah, right. Like what you said. Yeah, like I uh, the four teams that I ref. Oh, sorry. They play Illinois State, Iowa State, Troy, and Minnesota. Minnesota, so they, they yeah. Do not okay. play Western Michigan again. I was wrong. But uh, and that's at Minnesota, and then they're at Ohio State. So, and and the Ohio State trip is in October. That's after the bye week, correct? Yes, that's after. Yeah, the bye. that's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. I got it. I got it. <laughs> so, uh, the thing that I think ultimately concerns me, and that you alluded to, is the quarterback situation and the personnel, because you can bring in a great coach. But if the personnel is not up to par, if things don't click, if things don't mesh, then there's only so much Tim Lester can do in his first year, especially after taking over of what was a dumpster fire of an offense and getting rid of some bad habits, whatever that might be. I don't know anything necessarily specifically, but translating to the new is is going to be difficult one way or another. Uh, I'm sure they're all th- saying thank God for the spring right now with with Tim Lester taking over and and things changing there. Um, do we want to hit on Caden Proctor and then get out of here? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, Unless you good with that? We got a thumbs up from us. Okay, we are go. Um, uh, what was I saying, Kirk? So Kirk never said Caden's name once. He did the whole he who will not be named sort of situation. And it was basically, he's not here. He doesn't want to be here. If he doesn't want to be here, we don't want him here. That's best for both parties. Wish him the best. See you later. Honestly, I don't think there's that much that we really need to cover here on the podcast. I think that can be really wrapped up well with with Adam. But Ross, in in knowing that, in in seeing the transcript, do you think there was anything else to really glean from that? I, I think we got low key Petty Kirk because he knows any, saying anything particularly negative about a 19 year old or 20 year old isn't going to look good for him. But he also didn't say his name one time. And that that might be just an NCAA issue, considering he's going to be in the portal here soon, though he technically isn't on Iowa's roster. And I, it's just a weird situation. Yeah, I mean, that even came up during the presser was like, where is Caden anyway? Like, is he is he in Iowa City? Is he still taking classes? And, you know, Ferentz is like, I don't know. And it kind of like, I don't care. He's not he's not part of our programs. So it's kind of not my problem was kind of his attitude, it seemed like to me. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think there was probably a little bit of pettiness there. But I think he's also like, I think this is the perspective that comes with coaching for you know 25 plus years is uh, you've seen a lot and you've been dealing with you know 18 19 20 year olds for that long is you know you've seen a lot of guys do a lot of dumb stuff or you know change their minds and and do whatever so I think it takes a lot to uh, surprise Kirk at this stage of the game and um I, I think he's he's got to be disappointed, obviously, and he's not going to express that publicly because, I mean, getting Proctor back was a tremendous coup for Iowa, and it was addressing an enormous need for that team heading into next fall, which is now not addressed. I mean, that came up during the press uh, presser too. Is hey, how's the offensive line look? You know, and um, nothing substantive there other than the fact that logan jones isn't practicing during spring because of a off-season surgery so i mean not a great sign either that you know one of your best uh guys on that unit is out for spring and you know hopefully you want you want him to get fixed up and better for fall but you also want him getting those reps in the spring and uh you know learning uh, the playbook with with tim lester too so yeah i mean i think it's just a situation where whatever disappointment or, or he has um, is definitely going to be kept private. He's not going to show it publicly. I I was more interested in his comments about uh, NIL and the portal. And, you know, I'm interested and I think you're going to write about this, Adam, but um, yeah, I am, you know, there's spoiler alert. (laughs) Spoiler. Um, 
I think there's some resignation to like, hey, this is just the way things are. And I, he says, I accept it. I, I <laughs> privately, I wonder how he really feels about it, but publicly, he's gonna, you know, say yes, I accept it. Um, but yeah, what what did you make of that, Adam? I guess I'll get a preview of your your article. The 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 thing that sort of jumped out to me, and and it sort of mirrored what we had written after the the, the news came out in the first place was this happened because it could uh it, like like kirk said there's no structure there's no framework and it makes it interesting in that i don't know if it's sustainable we're gonna have to be able to have a framework and a mode of operation it's just part of the business i guess unfortunately we haven't experienced too many of those things but like at some point unless college football and and especially the 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 biggest sort of name programs out there. I mean, Alabama's happy about this, clearly. But I guarantee you they don't want it happening to them. I guarantee you they don't want, you know, next player, you know, 2.0 to, to come in and say, oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm I actually going to go to Georgia. No, psych, I'm going back to Bama. No, psych, I'm going to Georgia. Like, if that happened and it was strictly contained in the SEC, there would be a rule banning it tomorrow. So there, there does, and Kirk mentioned that this is a lawyer situation at this point. And yeah, there's something to that because one, there's already lawsuits that sort of allowed Proctor to be able to transfer and play right away to begin with. But really what that means is this, now with all this money that's being thrown around, uh, L L L Elliot is, is not, yes, just, sir. not just transfer, but transfer twice. Yes. In one spring. Yep. And and still be able to play right away. Yes. And, and yeah. And and so that's a situation where it's one thing for the NCAA to say, well, that's that's not allowed anymore. Yeah, sorry, there were lawsuits. So yes, it is. So this is a situation where the lawyers need to get together and I, this these are dirty words to college administrators and, and have been for decades, have been for as long as the term student athlete was invented which happened because TCU didn't want to pay for the medical care for a kid who got paralyzed on the field after he was done being a college student. Look that one up. They, the, if they really want to keep this from happening over and over again, it's going to have to involve collective bargaining. It's going to have to involve contracts and it's probably going to have to involve referring to these guys as employees, which they are because they're doing this on behalf of the university. They're wearing the right clothes as agents of university, right? They're wearing Nike and they can't rep Adidas if they want to. And they're not doing it for college credit, are they? It would be cool if football were a major. It would be, I think, intellectually honest. But since they're not, and, and since this is quite clearly labor that they're performing on behalf of the university for the benefit of the university... And maybe, you know, they'll they'll get a few pennies here and there. But by and large, like, the university isn't sharing that money. That is an employer-employee relationship. And the NCAA has gotten around it by calling them student-athletes for decades. That house of cards is falling in front of our eyes as we speak and, and has been for the last few years. The sport just needs to get honest with itself. And... College administrators have fought against it for decades, and I don't think it's a winnable fight anymore. They, they've they've got to approach it in good faith. They got to understand that collective bargaining, both of those words are important, and that the players are not going to get everything they want. In fact, what, what comes out of collective bargaining is probably, if that were to happen in college sports, what comes out of it will probably be more restrictive than what college sports is now. And that will be better not only for the programs, but for the players themselves, because it would allow them some stability that is currently not even enforceable. And without any enforceable rules, you don't have a structure. You don't have a framework. You are going to keep getting Caden Proctor situations happening, not only at Iowa, but anywhere in college football, anywhere where there's money being thrown around. And again, kudos to the Swarm for making sure that Caden Proctor did not get a whole lot of that money that was promised to him 
uh, when he came to Iowa. And, and they'll also say he wasn't promised any money to come, but he only got a little bit of money out of that car dealership, didn't get any of the swarm collective money, didn't get the fans money. So kudos to them for that. But this is just going to keep happening until there's a more permanent solution. Uh, Kirk Ferentz is acutely aware of that based on his comments. And I, I don't really know of a football coach, a, a D1 Power 5 head coach at this point, who doesn't think that way. Uh, guys, either of you guys sort of disagree with that? It, in, any different reads of the situation? We could talk about this stuff for hours. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we kind of already have. Right? You can go back. I was going to say, like, no one's going to stick around for it, but we could do it. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right, so yeah. I, on that note, I'm I'm good to wrap it up here. Ross, did you feel like you needed to add anything? No, I think we've uh, we've discussed all of this stuff tonight for just about the right, you know, way too long. So yeah, we're good. <laughs> and you're you're getting staticky right now as well so perfect uh, well, even your mic quit. has given up on tonight the mic has said call it quits so we will wrap it up here on uh, this episode of hawkcast we appreciate you tuning in um of course do not forget to head over to iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe to get all of our premium content that's following the transfer portal that's following spring recruiting that's following women's basketball and of course everything to come with spring football as well definitely want to stay tuned for that if you're watching on youtube make sure you hit that subscribe button drop a like drop a comment let us know what you're thinking about women's basketball all those dinguses that had the, something to say after this last game the the men <clears throat> and who they should go after in the portal a guard a center somebody else who should they get how are they going to get them and then of course all things iowa football we want to hear from you down in those comments and Wherever you are listening, please hit that subscribe button. Don't miss an episode here of Hotcast, whether that's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you are. Leave that rate and review. It helps us out a bunch. We really appreciate it. And uh, I think that's it after this 34-hour-long podcast. We appreciate you tuning in. I am Elliot Clough at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by publisher Adam Jacoby and managing editor of the site at iowa.rivals.com, Ross Binder. And for now, we will see you next time.